That's coming up a bit later in the show. But now a music treat for the next hour. We're going to be talking about the best year ever of music for our next guest. But I want you to guess what year you think it is. I want to set the scene. Do you know what year it is? In this year, Australians voted to include First Nations people in the national census for the first time. In this year, Australia's Prime Minister, Harold Holt, disappeared while swimming in Portsea. And in this year, John Farnham had his first hit number one, Sadie the Cleaning Lady. Do you know what year I'm talking about? Yep, 1967 it is. And it's considered the uh, best year ever for music by my guest tonight, although I don't think uh, Sadie the Cleaning Lady would be in his top <laughs> 10 list. And my guest is Derek Polici. He's the drummer and founding member of the Little River Band. Welcome to Nightlife, Derek. Hello, Indira. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's great. I'm really looking forward to this hour because I think 1967 was a pretty good year of music as well, so it's going to be a lot of fun. But tell me why you think that year was your favourite year, Derek. Well, the songs were just wonderful. I mean, you know, obviously all this stuff is kind of, you know, um, based upon one's own connection with music and when, you know, uh, when you were born. And uh, I think this this type of discussion I have with my friends all the time about, you know, I say, oh, music was great in the 60s <laughs> and the 70s. And, of course, everyone says, I think uh, Paul Simon said uh, in one of his lyrics that every generation throws a hero up the pop charts. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just my, it's my generational thing. You know, I was at the perfect age in the 60s. I emigrated from England in 1961. I came to Victoria with my mother and father and my older brother. And um, we got, as I said, we got here in 61 and three years later, my brother took me down the road. We were living in Carlton in Melbourne and my brother took me down the road to the Southern Cross where this band from England, the Beatles, <laughs> had just <laughs> arrived. And even though, you know, I couldn't afford to go and see them play, um, my brother, I, I was just staring at them up on the mezzanine of the Southern Cross Hotel and um, it was just an epiphany for me. I, it was just incredible. I looked around me and saw everyone going absolutely berserk at these sort of technicolour deities that were standing up on the on the mezzanine. And and from that moment, I mean, I was about 13 years old, um, I just thought, or 11 years old, I should say, um, I thought, that's what I want to do. You know, it's like when John Lennon said he went and saw Elvis for the first time on on a newsreel footage or television, and he said, that's what I want to do. Um, so it was a kind of situation for me. Then I saw the Beatles and I thought, that is just wonderful. And um, and that music that, that took me right through the 60s, and in fact, you know, the Beatles were kind of like my my um, kindergarten, my grade school and my university. Yeah. So they took me right through to 69, which is when I started at 16 years old, I became a professional musician at 16 and went out on the road quite early in life. Um, but so, but the Beatles were kind of my guiding handbook and everything else that was around them, like the Dave Clark Five, that whole English sound, uh, the British invasion, was all kind of supplementary to the Beatles. But the Beatles were always the central focal point. But there was just so much wonderful music. And, and as the 60s progressed, and then we got to that summer of love, that 67 period, 68 and 69, which was capped off by Woodstock. It was just the most wonderful time, you know, in, in life for me. Yeah. It was all positive and, and a lot of people look back now and say us baby boomers kind of messed everything up. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a good time and kind of didn't really make any major changes. Uh, but, um, I mean, you you were there at one of those seminal moments to have actually seen the Beatles at that, that age. I'm not surprised you ended up going into music yourself. But the other thing we're looking at with these tracks you've brought us, Derek, is because you are a drummer, you are focusing as well on the drumming and the drumming elements of these these songs. So t tell us, well, well it, it's not surprising that the first track you're bringing for us is a Beatles track. It's Strawberry Fields Forever. Tell us about Ringo Starr's drumming in, in, in this song. Well, Ringo kind of, you know, often gets a bit of a bad rap from, from, uh, from people who are into more technical drummers like the jazz greats like uh, 
Buddy Rich and, and, and you know, for, for any of those um, drumming aficionados out there that, that, that follow these session drummers, yeah. guys like uh, Steve Gadd and, uh, you know, the, the real technical drummers, but Ringo for me, and I must make a point here that, that I, I didn't come from a musical family and, and, my, and I had very old-fashioned English parents who didn't even play a radio in the house. Oh, right. And, it, and if it hadn't have been for my brother who was six years older and, and, and kind of was tapping into music and, and probably the first thing he introduced me to were the Everly Brothers and, and, and music like that. And, 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 of course, he was, being a bit older, he was sort of into Elvis and stuff like that. But, but the whole thing with, with Ringo was that... Um, what I didn't realise was that I was listening to this guy who was very simplistic but so supportive of the song. I think Ringo made a, 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 came out with his own explanation once that he was sort of like the silt on the bottom of the river, that, that he held everything together. And I think if you put a busier drummer or a more technical drummer into the Beatles, I don't think it would have worked as well. Right. I think that when you listen to the Beatles, Ringo is the is the underlying foundation on which they built this wonderful harmonic and melodic and melodic music. Here's Strawberry Fields Forever. Derek Polici from the the drummer and founding member of the Little River Band is my guest on Nightlife tonight. Best year ever is 1967, and that track was Strawberry Fields Forever, The Beatles. Uh, Derek, you had the the great fortune of actually working with The Beatles' longtime producer, George Martin, for a number of weeks. Tell me how that came about. Oh, what a wonderful experience. Um well, we had recorded the first Under the Wire album, which had some very big hits on it, um, which was uh, Lonesome Loser and Cool Change. And um, we were really starting, you know, our, our star was uh, was on the ascent. Yeah. And, um, and so as Capitol Records felt that the next record had to really be the one. They said that the... This next record for you guys will be the Hotel California or, or it will be your rumours. And so it was very exciting that we had the record company supporting us in that way. And they said, um, okay, you've got an open ticket. Go out and pick your producer. Wow. And so so the band sat around and and, and strangely enough, it was surprisingly enough, we, we talked about people like Benny and Bjorn from ABBA. Uh, we talked about Tom Dowd who produced the uh, – the Ocean Boulevard album for, yeah. for Eric Clapton. Um, and, of course, the, you know, we, we were all quite unanimous about um, George Martin. And um, we were just absolutely blown away when he just said yes. And and for me as a musician and, and us as a band, it was just so flattering. And I, and I just couldn't believe, once again, we keep coming back to this Beatles thing, but I just couldn't believe that this kid who stood there at 11 years <laughs> yeah. old and saw the Beatles was working with their producer, you know, not that much, you know, later later on. Oh, it and would have it, been so surreal. So so what was it like? Was he how you imagined? Oh, he was wonderful. He he was and I don't I hope this doesn't count, sound any way disrespectful, but when we we met him in a very magical place, we were on tour in America and we did a show in New Orleans and he flew out from England and he came and saw the show and then we walked back through the French quarter of New Orleans on a very steamy misty evening and he was dressed like a ship's purser you know he, yeah. he sort of had the double-breasted blue blazer he had the wonderful english uh, you know accent and and voice the james mason type voice and he was just wonderful and 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 I, I mean, we were all excited, but I was, you know, I've always been a bit of an exuberant kind of a kid. And I, I was just so excited. I just couldn't believe I was walking through New Orleans <laughs> with, with, the, with the Beatles producer. And um, so we and, and what was even more exciting was he'd, he'd built his own studio in the Caribbean on an island called Montserrat, which mm. unfortunately got wiped out by a volcano um, and is no longer operating. But but we went there just after Paul McCartney did his Tug of War album, so the place still kind of felt like it had had sort of Paul Beetle McCartney's energy. There. Yeah, yeah, it was so it was all magical, and we spent six weeks there, and it was just absolutely incredible. It was absolutely incredible, and of course, we were told when we spoke to his manager, please don't talk to George about only talk about the Beatles. You know, he <laughs> he has done other things. You know. <laughs> He'd done. He'd worked with America, and he'd worked with the Goons, and you know, he'd he'd worked with um, all sorts of different 
people. Um, and so I did. I thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to break this rule. And, and because I was the one guy that kind of didn't hassle him all the time, we actually formed this kind of really interesting bond. And one day I was sitting out by the swimming pool and he came out with a, a, a Walkman, which was, you know, the days of the portable cassette recorder. Mm. And, he, and he had two sets of headphones and he played me something that he'd been working on with the London Symphony. And, I, and I'm sitting there sharing, uh, you know, a, a cassette recording, sharing headphones with George Martin. And I just thought, <laughs> It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> no, yeah, pretty lucky, pretty amazing. Derry Polici, drummer and founding member of the Little River Band, is my guest on Nightlife tonight. He is programming this hour of music, his favourite tracks, best year ever, 1967. The next one you have for us, Derek, is a mama's and papa's track. Yeah, dedicated to the one I love. And it, it's so hard picking favourites from all of these acts, but especially the Mummers and the Puppers. I just adored the Mummers and the Puppers. Mm. And it's interesting that I think uh, hopefully that I, I procured the gig when I tried out with Mississippi, which was the band that, that preceded Little, Little River Band. Little band, yeah. When I tried out, I, I would like to think that the thing we spoke about earlier, which was my sympath- being sympathetic towards vocals and staying out of the way of all of the great melodic stuff, um, that was a thing also. I adored harmonies, and so I, I just loved the harmonies of the Mamas and the Puppers. I loved uh, Mama Cass's voice. I thought she was an incredible singer. And But what I didn't know at the time was that the drummer that I was really enjoying um, was a guy called Hal Blaine, who is probably the most recorded pop drummer of all time. Yeah. He, I mean, um, I wrote this in my notes that that we I could probably talk about Hal Blaine for an hour <laughs> just on his, on his own. But Hal Blaine has just played for so many people that the list would be endless to mention. But um, that that's another thing I love when I listen to the Mummers and the Puppers is Hal Blaine. I must have listened to a literally hundreds of Hal Blaine recordings, and he's so good, I've never heard him make a mistake. I can't can't stand it that this guy is that good. (laughs) Let's see him, let's hear him in action. What a track, dedicated to the one I love. Mamas and the Puppers with Hal Blaine in action there on the drums. My guest is Derek Polici, uh, a founding member of the Little River Band and a lover of drums, a drummer himself. Derek, I want to ask you, you said your parents... uh, didn't even have a radio. What did they think when you went into music? Well, I think my father, like most fathers, certainly from that era, um, you know, weren't that keen about me being a musician. But but my father always gave me kind of uh, sent out mixed messages. I remember that, um, and, and just proceed, you know, preceding the next track we're going to play. But um, one of the things was that um, I, we we went to King Island which I'd never even heard of the place. My father got a job over on King Island um, in 1966. Right. And, uh, and, and you know, King Island is in the Bass Strait in between uh, Victoria and Tasmania. And I felt like I was in a penal colony or something. <laughs> it's pretty you know, isolated, we were, yeah. It was very isolated and, and I was just taken away from all of the incredible things that were happening in Melbourne with music in the 60s and... Um, and my dad just said, oh, you know, you'll just get a job at the mine here. It was an open-cut mine. And, and I thought, he's out of his mind, you know. But, the, <laughs> but when, So I was still going to school when we went to King Island and, um, and I was growing a little bit of long hair. And the funny thing was about this mixed messages thing was that I'd get notes from school saying, could Derek please get his hair cut? And my dad would write <laughs> notes back to school saying, my son's hair is his his, you know, his, his thing. business. <laughs> yeah, and yet, but, but then he would tell me, Derek, your hair's getting a bit long, you know. So I always got these mixed messages. But with my mother, my mother was always the one that was just right behind me. My mother was a very clever machinist and seamstress, and she made my early sort of psychedelic outfits and paisley ties <laughs> for, for my early bands that I was in. So even though they 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 didn't understand the music thing at all, I don't think, but um, but my mother especially supported me in anything that I believed in. She got behind anything, you know, okay, if Derek thinks this is what he wants to do, um, I'll support him all the way, which was terrific. Oh, that's what you need. Your next yeah. uh, next track is from the Young Rascals. This was such a big hit for them, wasn't it? 
Yeah, uh, t- uh, tremendous. And and once again, I, I feel a bit guilty because Dino Donnelly, the band's drummer, was such a fabulous drummer. Um, but the track I picked, I just had to go for Grooving. Yeah. Because Grooving was a song. It came out, you know, while I was on King Island. And I used to uh, listen to it on the radio and I would think to myself, oh, man, I'm, I'm stuck on this island and these guys are over there in New York and I could just imagine them driving around Manhattan or the Bronx or, you know, Staten Island or whatever. And, and I thought, those guys are so lucky. I'm here on King Island. But one of these days I'll get out of here, you know. <laughs> so the, the, the track Groovin' was just, you know, just my escapism. Another beautiful track proving that 1967 was a pretty good year for music, The Young Rascals with Grooving. My guest is Derek Pellici from a founding member of the Little River Band. You with Indira and I do on Nightlife. Derek, are you, are you feeling like you're in 1967? Often our guests say that when they play and listen to all these tracks with headphones back to back in this hour, they really get transported back to that era. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and look, I, I'm just so pleased to be doing a show like this and to be speaking with you, may I hasten to say, because uh, I've always been such a big fan of you and I still miss you reading the news. Oh, thank you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no I, I, I do. And one of the things that I do, because I'm so tragic now in my sort of retirement, um, and, and I communicate with people and I always do the um, Desert Island Disc kind of thing. Yeah. It's, a way of, it's a way of me checking out people and seeing what they're into. So I always say, here's my top ten songs. <laughs> so when I was offered this opportunity, I, I thought, oh, well, this is not a problem for me. I've got my top ten sitting there on my computer. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty so, good. Yeah, Pretty good. Uh, well, let's just move on to the, the next track here because they're so so good and I want to make sure we, we play them all. This is a, another fabulous song, The Kinks, Waterloo Sunset. So tell me about their drummer, Mick Avery. Well, yeah, I, 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 I'd love to have met Mick. But, you know, another thing I found out was when I t- talked about Hal Blaine before, Yeah, I knew that Hal Blaine played drums for so many bands. I, I wish I could remember the wonderful phrase, but... I remember bumping it. I think it was uh, Liberty DeVito. I got to know Liberty DeVito really well, who who was Billy Joel's drummer on just about all of his catalogue. And Liberty said that when he found out that Hal Blaine played drums on so many things, he sort of thought that the all the drummers that he had, had, had admired growing up were all the one drummer. They were all Hal Blaine. <laughs> um, and and but but Mick Avery didn't play on one of the the Kinks' signature songs, You Really Got Me, or All Day of, or, or All of the Night. Yeah, right. um, there was an English drummer who who also was kind of like a Hal Blaine um, called uh, Bobby Graham. And I only found this out in the last couple of years. And Bobby Graham played for, you know, on so many, for from Dusty Springfield to whatever. So he played on All Day and All of the Night, but then Mick Avery joined the band and Mick is pretty good in his own right and he certainly plays great on Waterloo Sunset. But the thing I love, probably second to the Beatles, um, my next favourite band would have been the Kinks. Uh, he's just such an incredible songwriter and so many English songwriters that I've had the pleasure to meet famous English songwriters, have all said to me that, um, you know, they they all hold such a, they hold uh, Ray Davies in such high regard. And, and this song is an absolute classic. The King's there with Waterloo Sunset. Derek Polici, founding member of the Little River Band, a drummer with them, is my guest. He's sharing his favourite tracks from his best year ever, and it was 1967, a pretty good year. Derek, I was just thinking that it's a Saturday night now that everyone's opened and bands and live music are, are back again, and there are probably a lot of band members going to gigs, coming back from big gigs, maybe listening to our conversation and thinking, oh, I would love to just have a little bit of the success that Derek had with his band. When you look back at the amazing uh, success and number of hits the Little River Band had, how much of it do you think was hard work? How much of it is luck? Gee, that is a fantastic question. I, I, I Maybe it's an e- equal amounts of both. I, I, I think that... Um, you know, like the the Eagles were kind of in a hiatus. The Eagles had sort of broken up, just as we were sort of coming through. And 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 um, we've discussed this within the band that maybe they left that little void. That little a door was ajar that yeah, we went right. into, and we went, we sort of went. Well, well, we're a harmony band too, you know, and we're kind of like a West Coast kind of harmony band. And of course, 
so many Americans still feel, um, still think that we were an American band. Um, and But then you have the other thing with the Americans where they thought that we spoke with an accent because <laughs> we spoke a foreign language in Australia. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> but I think that the, the greatest experience was being the first Australian band really. I mean, I know that the, the Seekers had had a little bit of success and and there were some Australians that sort of popped through. I don't think Frank Ifield kind of had a little bit of success. But we were the first sort of pop band that went over there and just got really stuck in into the trenches. And But we were just like kids in a lolly shop. You know, we were driving around. I remember driving past a McDonald's when they still hadn't sold a million hamburgers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was, so we we were just absolutely in awe of being in America where all of our, you know, most well, a lot of our heroes came from. Of course, a lot of our earlier heroes were from the UK, the British invasion, as I said earlier. But it was just such an incredible experience. And I, I think that I mentioned before that I think that um, Australia had a wonderful training ground with our pubs, and and you know, all in, individually, like Beeb when he was in the Zoot, and Glenn when he was in the Twilights, and Glenn and then he went into mm. Axiom. We all went out and, and did our apprenticeship in the pubs, the Matthew Flinders's and, the, and all the gigs around Sydney and Queensland and driving across the Nullarbor to Perth. Yeah. And I remember talking to Glenn Fry from the Eagles, not to name drop, but but because, uh, you know, we, we had the pleasure of, of, of Glenn Fry coming out to Australia and being our special guest when we did Expo 88 up in Queensland and talking to Glenn Fry and he said, you guys are just so great live um, because you had this opportunity of, you know, we were playing five or six nights a week for year after year and we just honed our skills. So I think a, a large part of it was when we got to America, we were ready and we hit the ground running. Yeah. You know. The next uh, song you have, uh, I think in the notes you passed on to my producer, you said you could listen to this song every day of your life. Yeah, yeah, and I said no, no pun intended because that was a, a successful Little River Band song. But I would, I must have listened to this song thousands and thousands of times, honestly. And when when it starts and that organ phrase comes in, um, it it just sends shivers down my spine. And and I love that the, the, this was another situation like the Kinks when when um, Procol Harum formed. They still hadn't decided on a regular drummer when they were cutting a wider shade of pale. So they brought in a guy, and now his name's either Bill Iden or Bill Eden, and they cut this track in two takes, and Bill Eden just is locked and loaded. He plays so wonderfully on this track, and then he walked out of the studio, took his paycheck, and that was it. Then they got a regular drummer. But to me, it is like a Hal Blaine performance. This guy is so in the pocket on this song but everything about it is just magical, from the feel to the lyrics to the words. It's just wonderful. A wider shade of pale, Procol Harum. Uh, Derek Polici from the Little River Band is sharing his favourite tracks from his best year ever, 1967. That's pretty close to a perfect track for, from my point of view, Derek. Absolutely loved hearing that again. I was just thinking when I was listening to that of you describing yourself as that high school boy with the long hair on King Island, listening to Groove and, and thinking, when am I going to have my young rascals moment? When, <laughs> when was it for you? When was it you was there feeling, I've made it. I'm actually there where I wanted to be. Wow. That, that's once again, that's great. I, I think, um, well, probably, look, with Mississippi, I was very, very proud, you know, like I said earlier, I think I went for an audition. Um, I, I was working in a clothing shop called uh, The In Shop for all those old people that remember <laughs> it. It was opposite Myers in the Burke Street Mall when it wasn't a Burke Street Mall in those days. And um, and we had, a, we had a music department in the store, so music was always playing and everything like that. But... but um, Beeb Birdles came in um, and I'd never met Beeb. You know, Beeb had been in the zoo, which was yeah. a, you know, a band of a very high calibre. I certainly wasn't in anything of that standard at the time. And Beeb came in with the Mississippi album under his arm. And this is just absolutely divine, you know, providence or whatever. He came in and said, I'm, I'm, I've, uh, I'm going for an audition with this band. They are absolutely incredible. The harmonies are wonderful. And he said they're looking for a drummer as well. So I 
you know, chucked along and uh, set up. And, and I was so loud, they had to put tea towers on my drums. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't used to loud drummers. But um, but I, I'm, I'm sure I'd like to think that, you know, I, I got the job in Mississippi, which then went on to become Little River Band, of course, because Beeb and Graham were, were in Mississippi with me as well. But I'm sure that all the music we're playing tonight, you know, put me in that place um, where, uh, you know, I... I I'd ingested all that music. It's like I put it into a bar mix and then when I had to play and create my own drumming for these songs and that's when, you know, you separate the wheat from the chaff. It's okay if you can just cut, do cover versions and stuff, but all of a sudden when, when a songwriter comes to you and says, okay, here's my song, what are you going to play on it? That's when you know you've got to find it. And so I sat down with Mississippi playing on their original songs and obviously they were happy with what I did. And, of course, that went on to, to be the same case within Little River Band. But I think as a performance situation, probably in Mississippi we did a lot of um, support work. We, you know, we, we supported everyone as diverse as Chuck Berry, Gary Glitter, wow. the, Jack, the Jackson Five, yes. the, the, the Faces. Um, and, and being on those stages with those people was and I thought we're getting somewhere here, but but I guess the real, you know, moment was when we walked on stage in um, Vancouver, Canada, and we headlined our very own the first concert that we ever headlined on our own to about oh, I don't know maybe it was only only about eight thousand people. Gosh, but but when you know that those eight thousand people have come to see you and you're not the support act, they've come to see you. That's when you know that uh, you're on the way up. Yeah, what a wonderful feeling. Extraordinary. Another Beatles song is next on your list. As you mentioned, they are a huge inspiration for you. This one, you say, is perhaps um, one of your favourites Beatles songs, All You Need Is Love. Yeah, I absolutely love it. And and the the interesting thing with this was, and I I think that, you know, another thing you say about music is is that when you – you close your eyes and you were saying before how people listen to the music they've, they've uh, programmed for, mm. the, for the show and, and they get absorbed into it. The thing with All You Need Is Love for me is it's, it, it really is the one song to me that encapsulates that psychedelic period of the 60s, which we're talking about tonight, 67, 68, you know. And, and, but what a fabulous song John Lennon wrote. And um, they performed this show on a a television show called This Is Our World, and it was the first live multinational, multi-satellite television production, Um, and Australia took part. We were one of the 14 countries that took part, and and, and probably a little embarrassingly, our part was showing a tram coming out of a tram. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) (laughs) But, but, But England said, oh, what we're doing is we're going to show you the Beatles in the studio recording All You Need Is Love. So I always have that visual that comes to mind when I listen to this song. There you go. The writer's fun of all you need is love the Beatles. Derek Leachy is programming this hour, best year ever, 1967. Uh, he's uh, obviously from the Little River Band. Derek, when you, you know, we're, we're featuring these songs because they're from 1967, but you're also giving us an insight into the drummers my husband is a huge fan of drummers. I mean, they're usually his favourite musician in a band yep. is the drummer. But that's not often the case with fans, not understanding the contribution, the role of, of drummers. Why do you think that is? Oh, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's a million drummers jokes as well. We seem to be the, <laughs> the butt of most of the yeah. jokes, more than the keyboard players or the bass players. Um, well, because maybe it's... It, it seems to be simplistic, and, and it is, of course. You know, I think probably in my naivety when I went to see the Beatles and then saw them, I thought, well, Ringo's the shortest, so so I'm I'm there, you know, because that, that was a real hang-up for me. I, I used to hate being short, um, but it, 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 I, I think I've finally gotten over it, you know, 69 years later. <laughs> I, I think I finally accepted but, um But so I thought, well, I'm short, I'll be the drummer. And, and it's probably the easiest thing to do. And, and technically it probably is. You don't have to learn chords and runs and scales and get sore fingers or hurt your lips playing a wind instrument. But even so, um, it, it requires, as I said, from my perspective, 
it requires that supportive skill of being the framework that the songwriter builds his song around. Um, and I think people don't probably think that deeply. You know, there might be a lot of people listening to these songs thinking to themselves, well, so far I haven't heard anything fantastic from the drummer <laughs> because they're waiting for something that is kind of technically proficient. Yeah. You know, some speedy roll or something that's Breakout rudimentary. Breakout solo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and look, I, I love that kind of thing too. And while we're on the subject of that, I, I think Ginger Baker is still the greatest oh, drum yeah. soloist because Ginger Baker's drum solos weren't like jazz technical solos. They were rhythmic patterns. Yeah. You know, beautiful rhythmic patterns. So I, I, I subscribe to that kind of drumming as well. That's why I used quite a big drum kit um, I, up until, the, you know, the, when I finished playing. I was using five tom-toms. Um, but but it, it, because it gave me a nice rhythmic um, and, and melodic structure around the drums. But, um, I, but by the same token, Indira, a lot of the music I listen to now doesn't have drumming in it. So it's kind of the... The opposite to what you were suggesting is that myself as a drummer, sometimes I listen to a wonderful guitar player called Pat Metheny or I may listen to uh, Paul Horn, a wonderful flute and saxophone player uh, from the 60s and 70s. Um, so I find that very relaxing. And maybe once again, that's because I'm looking for listening to music that doesn't have drums so that I know, okay, you know, I know what I need to put in next time I hear something that doesn't have drums. I know exactly what I'm going to be putting in here because I've, I've listened to so much music without drums as well. I think that's just as important for a drummer. And I think a lot of drummers get so hung up on drumming that it makes them too busy and too technical. Mm. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, Derek. I, only oh, that's have, okay. I know I only have room for one more song. I've I've got the small faces, Ichiku Park here. Uh, I think we'll go with that'll fit the time that I have. But it's been absolutely brilliant spending this hour with you, sharing uh, these wonderful musical memories. We've been getting so many lovely messages from listeners uh, who have also enjoyed your musical choices. So thanks so much, Derek, for your time. Oh, thank you. And I'm sorry I was so long winded. Not at all. Really it was. It, it wasn't long winded at all. <laughs> It was so, so enjoyable. Uh, we could, yeah, keep on going for another hour, uh, definitely. But thanks for your time. Derek Polici, drummer and founding member of the Little River Band, his best year ever, 1967. And this is the last track from his uh, lot of songs, The Small Faces, Ichiku Park. And, of course, you would have noticed that was not the small faces, Itchy Koo Park. That was uh, indeed The Box Stops the Letter, which was also one of the tracks from 1967 that uh, Derek Polici uh, wanted us to play. But there you go. We played it there. We're uh, coming up to news time.